I grew up in a church where this was the 1980s and our pastor told us these supermarket scanners, that's the mark of the beast. And so you're terrified of what are these microchips or whatever. Actually, it's scarier than that because you could always know I don't have the mark of the beast because I don't have anything that I can see on my hands and forehead. It doesn't matter whether you could see it. You, you can have the mark of the beast any time that you buckle in fear to that power. What are they going to do to me? To the point that you start to actually idolize that kind of power. Welcome to the Blessed Podcast. I'm Nancy Guthrie, author of the newly released book, Blessed, Experiencing the Promise of the Book of Revelation. The book of Revelation begins and ends with the promise that those who hear and keep what is written in it will be blessed. And I want that blessing, don't you? So that means we need to hear what this book has to say to us and then figure out what it's going to mean for us to live in light of it. On this podcast, I'm having conversations with people who can help us to hear it, to understand its message to us and help us reckon with what it will mean for us to live in light of that message. And my guest today is Russell Moore. Russell, thank you for being willing to talk with us about the book of Revelation. Oh, glad to. I'm looking forward to it. Russell Moore is the public theologian at Christianity Today and director of Christianity Today's Public Theology Project. He's the author of numerous books, and one of the books that he's written that made me want to talk to him about Revelation was a book he wrote recently called The Courage to Stand, Facing Your Fear Without Losing Your Soul. It's because of that book I wanted to talk to him about Revelation because it seems to me that the book of Revelation is a call to courage, a call to bold allegiance to Jesus Christ. As we think about the first audience that this book was written to, we know that many of them were already facing severe persecution. At the opening of the book, when John identifies himself, he calls himself a partner in the tribulation, the kingdom, and the patient endurance that are in Christ Jesus. So he's speaking to people who are experiencing some of the same kind of persecution that he, in fact, is experiencing as he is there on the Isle of Patmos. As I think about the message of Revelation, I would say the message of Revelation is a call to patient endurance of suffering for our bold allegiance to Christ and a call to refuse to compromise as we wait for the king and the kingdom to come in all of its glorious fullness. So as you think about Revelation, Russell, do you think I'm on the right track of it being a call to courage? I do. I mean, especially when you look at at the first couple of chapters of Revelation, where what John is doing is he's talking about these failures of courage that come from outside and inside. And so you have at the beginning talking about uh, what you just mentioned, this, this partner in tribulation. There's a Roman Empire that, of course, is armed to the teeth against the church. Church has already seen Jesus crucified by that Roman Empire. They have every reason to believe that they're next. And he calls them to overcome or to, to conquer, depending on how it's translated. And then you have the, the failures of courage that can come from the inside. Um, for instance, uh, tolerating uh, people within the church who are teaching something other than the gospel, something that's destructive. If you think about that, I mean, we tend to think sometimes that that's just coming from a oh, kind of lackadaisical attitude, but usually it's coming from fear. You're, you're, you're fearful of how you look to people or how people are going to respond to you, and so it's easier just to let those things go. And so he's speaking to all of that together and then, of course, going through and showing what's actually happening behind the veil that's not apparent to us where it looks like you're losing 
when in fact the losing is is victory. I grew up in a really prophecy chart oriented uh, kind of church where revelation was preached a lot, but it was about uh, how certain images were mushroom clouds or black helicopters. And so it was a very scary book and then a kind of disillusioning book because certain things that we were told were right around the corner uh, ended up not being. And, uh, and so it would be easy just to kind of leave Revelation alone until you start realizing what's there and how it's not simply speaking to something out there in the future, but it's, it's showing you what's going on all around you that you can't see in which you are, as Bible says elsewhere, more than conquerors mm-hmm. in Christ. I mean, I think that is just invigorating. Well, one of the things that keeps coming up in Revelation is it's calling, it, 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 it's making promises to those who conquer, yeah. or in some translations, those who overcome. How would yeah. you define what that means to conquer or overcome well it doesn't mean what it at first glance looks like to us because i think when we have a sense of conquering there's this sense of visible victory vindication i win you lose that sort of thing and that's exactly what revelation is saying is not what it means to overcome So you have this call to endurance taking place at the beginning uh, in the letters to the churches. And then you move on through and you you say, um, what according to Jesus through John does it mean to say overcome the beast? It's not to defeat him in some sort of visible way. It is to be beheaded. That doesn't sound. That doesn't sound like conquering. Like conquering. Yeah. Or, or if you think of um, what does it mean to overcome the devil? Revelation chapter twelve. Uh, they they loved not their lives even until death, and they overcame him. But with what? The blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. I mean, that doesn't look like sort of wrapped up storyline kind of victory that we often want. And then I think that's that's one of the major themes going on here is, is saying to people, there's a different sort of winning. And if you, if you take your life and you look at it only within the grid of your 80, 90, 100 years, however long your life is, you're not going to have you're not going to see the actual story and you're going to come up with ways of overcoming that actually are surrendering. Well, let's dive into some of the text of Revelation. I especially want you to look with us at the letters that Mm. are in chapters two and three of Revelation and then jump to 13 and talk about the beast and maybe get to 17 about Babylon. So let's first look at some of these, these churches to whom John has been instructed to write. Let's look at the church at Pergamum. Mm -hmm. They were affirmed. They were were told, I know you dwell where Satan's throne is. Mm -hmm. You hold fast to my name. You did not deny my faith, even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was killed among you where Satan dwells. Yet I have this against you. So here he is. He's, He's affirming them. For the courage we've been talking about, the courage in the face of being put to death for faith. There is a problem, though. There's a problem of false teaching and that they need courage to stand against false teaching. Mm -hmm. Why does Jesus say to them, I know where you live, where where Satan dwells? Why why does he say, I know that you have held fast? He's, He's saying to them, I know you. So it's really similar to what you see happening in John 1 and 4, where Jesus says to Nathanael, I saw you. Uh, you know, when he says, behold, an Israelite in whom there is no guile, Nathanael has every reason to say, you don't know me. I mean, you just meet someone and they compliment you. That doesn't. But then he says, I saw you when you were under the fig tree. He knows him. And he's affirming this. And then you come to John 4, and he he speaks to the woman at the well and and says, I know about your situation with your husbands and with the man who's not your husband. And 
what when she goes into the town, she says, come and see someone who told me everything about myself. He knows, uh, knows her. So it's the positive and the negative. He knows it. And so Jesus is saying to Pergamum, he says, I, I know the difficulty of your situation, and I know that you haven't thrown overboard the faith like a lot of people have. But here are these other things that I know. That, that's coming in and he's he's separating which actually is if you think about it a grace it's a grace to be known by someone you can trust yes Th- there's a sense where i think that some people would see jesus intervening uh, like this as being harsh when in reality what jesus is doing here is averting something harsh he, he's saying to people i'm not i don't want you to go in this direction that will destroy you ultimately mm-hmm. and so that's that's gracious and i'm holding out this promise to you i mean each one of these churches if they will repent when he has pointed out something they need to repent of there's a beautiful promise yes held out and as you go through what's being promised, they're all centered in who he is, and they're centered in his coming and establishing the new creation. They have to look very far forward, most of them, yeah. to anticipate the realities of what's being promised. And that's really the essence of living by faith. <laughs> it's, it's us living by faith, right? We're yeah. not expecting in this life to get everything that Jesus has promised. But no, we're looking toward the future when we will be rewarded if we have the courage to endure, to conquer, to overcome. But we, And we can be sure that what he has promised will become the reality that we will live in forever. Yes, and that's, that's what I find so interesting, specifically about Pergamum, what he promises. To the one who conquers, I will give some of the hidden manna so he's using this biblical language of bread from heaven that he talks about in John 6 coming out of uh, Exodus. And I will give him a white stone with a new name written on the stone. And, and here's the thing I find interesting, that no one knows except the one who receives it. So if you think about what this reward is, you have God uh, who consistently in Scripture is renaming people. And he's renaming them in ways that usually do not make sense. Abram, you're now Abraham, father of many nations. He was named that before there were any offspring. And it, it, it almost seems kind of cruel to name him that. Or when Jesus says to Simon, your name is Peter, rock. This does not seem like a rock uh, at all. Well, now Jesus is saying this to the church at at Pergamum. He says, there's a a stone with your new name written on it, which which is to say Jesus is going to do for them what he has done in the past, which is he doesn't give you a name describing who you are. He gives you a name and then he conforms you to the name. There's so much of your story that you don't know and you can't ever know. It, it's sort of revealed after the fact to you. And I, I think that's what Jesus is saying there to the church at Pergamum. I, I have a storyline for you that I am writing and you can't see it yet. Let's go to the church in Sardis. When mm. I read what Jesus, this one who knows them, has to say to them, he says to them, you have the reputation for being alive, but you are dead. Yeah. Wake up and strengthen what remains and is about to die. Now, we know this was written to an actual church, Sardis. Mm-hmm. Of course, he was writing to seven churches, which seems to indicate he's writing to all the churches in his day. But I have to tell you, Russell, when I read this, I wonder if this might be what he would write to so much of the church in the West today. Does it strike you that oh, way? Oh, yes. I mean, I, I think that, that that you have the reputation of being alive, and yet you are dead. A, a member of my church was mentioning yesterday an article that had been written by our friend Ray Ortland some time ago that talked about a life cycle of churches going from movements to monuments to mausoleums. 
And I, I and and this was somebody who was really sort of chastened because he was looking at a church that had died uh, in our city, and thinking about all the people who were talking, uh, who had come to Christ there and who had uh, been called to ministry there and all sorts of other things. This was a really living church at the time. That is tragic, but it's not as tragic as this sense of churches that often have the illusion of life when they really just have good programming or um, they really have uh, activity that's going on, all of those things, but there's not, it's coming from the flesh, it's not coming from the spirit. Yeah, as you were saying that, so you said activity, programs, I was just thinking, what are the other things that give us the illusion of life when there's a really a spiritual deadness inside. I suppose we have to look at it. You know, he's speaking to churches, so we think about a, a church as an entity, but we could also make this individual, couldn't uh-huh. we? Yeah, yeah. What would be those things we think might be signs of spiritual life, but they're not dependable for that? Well, I mean, worship can can be that. There, there's a a kind of worship that at least I find myself falling into sometimes that is really kind of nostalgia. I'm, I'm connecting with where God has met me in the past somewhere, which is, is good and necessary. Uh, and that's the reason why you have uh, Ebenezer and all of the, the monuments and memorials. But if it's just that, I think you can fool yourself uh, into thinking that you're in communion with Christ right now, when in reality you're just sort of trying to remember something mm-hmm. and and reconnect. It kind of reminds me of um, I was talking to someone one time who had been in this long distance relationship with someone where they communicated mostly by text, and then they were able to see each other uh, again uh, after pandemic and so forth. And he was saying. To be honest, it was kind of disappointing because he said during, you know, when they were just having these text conversations, they he was able to sort of imagine her the way he wanted to imagine her. And when he met her, it is actually meeting her. And, it, you know, they weren't, that they actually didn't have the kind of relationship he was imagining they had. I think sometimes that happens with worship where it's, it's easy for us to feel as though we're spiritually alive because we just know how to sort of program ourselves. So, for instance, there's this YouTube video that, that shows Buckingham Palace the day of or maybe the day after September 11th. And the orchestra starts playing the Star Spangled Banner. And you have all of these visiting or expat Americans who are there sobbing. Every time I see that, I'm going to tear up and be emotionally moved. I know that uh, when when I go to it. There are some ways that we can think we're worshiping when in reality what we're doing is we just know where the emotions are that we can kind of manipulate. And then there are other times when we actually are worshiping, but we don't feel like it. Because it just seems so ordinary, means of grace kinds of ways. I think that's how you can get this feeling of being alive. But even more than that, I mean, notice what he says, you have the reputation for being alive. And it, it is really easy to construct a reputation. You think about this challenge uh, for Sardis in a social media age, oh. where it, Everything is about constructing your reputation in a way that filters out the things you don't want people to see and and shows the things you do want people to see. What can happen is you can then confuse your reputation for yourself. Let's go on to Laodicea because mm-hmm. I think once again, this sounds so contemporary to me where Jesus, this one who knows his church, he, it's almost like he puts words in their mouth. He's saying, you say, I am rich, I have prospered. And then these three words that really 
got me as I was working on this passage in Revelation. I thought these are three words that should never come out of the mouth of a Christian that they are saying, in a sense, by their lives, I need nothing. Yeah. So they think they've got everything they need. This, To me, it just screams a lack of dependence on God, uh, uh, so much self-sufficiency. I wonder if that's also a mark of our modern church, that it's actually possible to carry on and have a lot of programs and activities and maybe even you know, the church is growing, more people are coming. And yet there's a real lack of dependence upon God, a self-sufficiency as a church and as people. Except that we often are so self-deceived that none of us would actually say that. There are very few people who would say, I don't need anything. Uh, But instead, that's how we're living. And it's sort of the subtext of our lives that we're, we're kind of mm-hmm. keeping hidden uh, from ourselves. Mm-hmm. And so you think about it in terms of, I think about this all the time in my own life when my wife and I were working through an adoption process. We started it. We didn't know how we were going to pay for it. We had no money uh, at all. And there was someone who came to me and said, uh, I've been left a, a little uh, inheritance by my mom. And I want to give some of that to you to help with this adoption. And I said, oh, you know, I don't, um, I don't need that. And we're going to be fine. God's going to take care of us. And this guy said, yes, he is. And here I am. <laughs> and, uh, and then at one point he says, I don't want to rebuke you, but I think this is really pride. Because it's similar to when Jesus is washing Peter's feet and Peter says, I I don't want you to wash my feet. That seems like humility, but it really is the pride that says, I don't need that. Uh, I'm not a charity case. I can take care of myself. Uh, And I, I think that that often shows up and we don't see it and we don't know it. I think I see it in myself, Russell, when there are seasons where... I am prayerless. Yes. Right? Oh, yes. Um, Because that's just a statement. Like, I think I can do this on my own. It it shows a lack of dependence on God, a lack of desperation for Him to work so Mm -hmm. that the things that I do would not be a work of the flesh, but would be a work of the Spirit. Yes. And usually, I don't know if this is the case for you, but when I find myself in those prayerless times, usually also find myself worrying. Which, if you think about it, that is itself a denial of dependency. Because what I'm saying is, I'm going to, I'm going to put this over and over again in my mind so that I can fix it ahead of time. And that's just not the way God works. Mm-hmm. Give us this day our daily bread. I mean, that's that's how God. And so we we have to have this sense of ongoing dependency that's what the abba cry is that's what the spirit does provoking us to cry abba uh that's a that's a baby crying out to a father in a sense of a complete dependence and when we lose that then we end up just building everything around ourselves or our idols all right let's spend some time uh in revelation 13 Mm -hmm. Which begins, and I saw the beast rising out of the sea with ten horns, seven heads, ten diadems on its horn, and blasphemous names on its head. Mm-hmm. This beast appears on the scene. In the previous chapter, we read about a dragon who we understand to be uh, Satan himself. And then here is this beast. Mm-hmm. Who is this beast? I think, and I asked that like it was a really simple question. Yeah, Did you notice? Okay. Yeah. I, I think that this beast is uh, humanity made ultimate. So in, in their case, you would have been looking at a Roman Empire where Caesar is worshiping himself and, and worshiping his power. But that's not only happening then. It's something that is happening... Uh, ongoingly at every moment from Eden to New Jerusalem. And I think the key to that is in these two images. One is of a beast, an animal, 
and the other is at the end, this calls for wisdom, let the one who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it's the number of a man, and his number is 666. Now this is thrown people because people are trying to, you know, what's the hidden code that's going here. I think that what's happening is you have this amplification, ju- just as we do with God, holy, holy, mm-hmm. holy, sixth day of creation, humanity, 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 you make it ultimate. And what happens when you make it ultimate? You become a beast. You become like an animal driven by your appetites. So this connects us, I think, all the way back with Genesis 3, where you have the the serpent, the the craftiest of all of the beasts of the field, uh, speaks to Eve. And what is he doing? He wants her to think of herself as a goddess. You will not surely die. You will be able, we will be like God, knowing good from evil. And yet what is actually happening? He is causing her to think of herself as less than she is because Mm -hmm. she's actually taking orders from a beast Mm -hmm. that she has been given dominion over in Genesis 1 and 2. So this, this grandiosity that we have to make ourselves ultimate ends up making us less than human. So what's the relationship between human government or the nation state and the beast? Well, you have a, an echo, I think, here of Daniel, where you have the, the nations spoken of as beasts and given these descriptions. I think the, the role particularly of the nation state is power. Uh, there's, a, there's a coercive power and so many uh, political theorists have boiled down. If you want to, what is a state? Uh, a state is that which has the power to kill you. Even just the sort of minor authority that comes with, if I'm pulled over uh, for speeding, I'm not necessarily worried about being killed, but the authorities that are there, police authorities who ultimately... Uh, if you don't obey me, I can kill you. That's what the cross was. It wasn't just a way of um, punishing people and putting people down who were causing a, a problem for the empire. They could have done that in private. It is a particularly shameful sort of death that is public along the roadside. So what Rome is saying is... Don't get out of line or this could be you. I mean, that, that, is a, that is a power that seems like it's ultimate power. And, and it seems like that to, to any uh, nation state or any sort of nexus of power because you think, what are you going to do if what I can do to you is the worst thing that could possibly be done? And Jesus comes in and says, that's not the worst thing that can possibly happen to you. You've already lived through it at the cross, and you will live through it here if you're, if you're faithful to the end. There isn't that power over you that you think. I think of you know, that little children's book, Where the Wild Things Are. We would read to our children over and over again until I, I have it memorized. Max, the little boy in the story, overcomes the wild things by looking into their eyes. And so you have this sense of the fears that come with childhood. Everything seems out of your control. And he doesn't ignore it. When he looks it right, looks it into its eyes, it breaks its power and he becomes king of all the wild things. I think that's pointing to something that is true for all of us. The things that scare us, we think, I'm just going to avoid thinking about that. I'm going to... But Jesus comes and says, no, we're going to talk about it. I'm going to put this out here because it doesn't have any power over you if you're in me. They, they, can't, they can't do anything ultimately to you. And so think, take that down a notch and think about it in terms of not an empire wanting to crucify you or behead you. But think about it, uh, there are people who are Sometimes they're living in a a really awful sort of work situation or an awful family situation, and they think the power that they have over me is to exclude me. 
and to say, oh, well, this, this person is whatever the label or definition they put to you. Jesus is saying, yeah, they can do that right now, but they can't do that ultimately. And so if, if what you're doing is sort of buckling under the fear of that, you're just taking way too short term of a view. I think that's the case with saying to the people of God, don't put that number on your forehead, which I don't think is a literal tattooing. And I grew up in a church where this was the 1980s, and our pastor told us these supermarket scanners, that's the mark of the beast. And so you're terrified of what are these microchips or whatever. Actually, it's scarier than that. Because you could always know, I don't have the mark of the beast because I don't have anything that I can see on my hands and forehead. It doesn't matter whether you could see it. You, you can have the mark of the beast any time that you buckle in fear to that power. What are they going to do to me? To the point that you start to actually idolize that kind of power. It's almost like Stockholm Syndrome here where you have this tendency of people to identify with their captors and to start to to almost admire their captors. I was seeing something uh, not long ago about cutting, about people who are sort of inflicting pain on themselves. And one of the reasons this person said for that is people are kind of wanting to go to an experience in their life that at least they know. They know this uh, sort of experience. I think we all tend to do that. And so there's a sense in which what you want to do is to find, okay, who's the strongest person in the room? And that person can protect me from all of the things that I'm afraid of. All I have to do is to be willing to see that power as being real power. I mean, the prophets are talking about that all the time. You, you want to go down to Egypt. Uh, so it's not just you, you're afraid of Egypt. You shouldn't be afraid of Egypt when you're leaving in the Exodus. God says, I'm going to be with you. And then uh, the prophets say, you want to go down to Egypt and make alliances with them because you think that their horsepower and their weaponry can protect you, and that's not where your problem is. I think we all have the tendency left to ourselves to do that. Yeah, so that mark of the beast, in a sense, it's a mark of identification, belonging, and saying, this is where my primary connectedness is with uh, humanity. Yeah. and humanity's power. People always have a question, what's the mark of the beast? But I think it's fascinating that very few ask the question about, well, what are all of these marks on pe- people's foreheads in the book of Revelation that are not the mark of the beast, but are actually this mark on a forehead of belonging to right. Christ, That's right? That's exactly right. Because the contrast is there. And and I think actually we've been seeing that throughout history. There's uh, in, in the Bible, there's been a way of marking one's self as belonging to Christ. I think back to the the blood on the doorpost mm-hmm. in mm-hmm. Egypt, uh, or the the priesthood. The the, the priest they're, they're going to wear their you know they've got all this robe and these um, you know precious uh, stones. They've got a turban, and then across their forehead, it's going to say, "Holy to the Lord." Mm-hmm. In many ways, this mark of the beast is the contrast to that, isn't it? Yes. The contrast of belonging, having your primary identity being belonging to God. Yes, and it's something that you can verify, uh, which is if, if, if what you're trusting in is that kind of power, then that's something you can always check and you can always know. So Revelation 13 says there's this pointing, who is like the beast? Who can make war on him? Um, there are a lot of people who, one, one person said to me, who's struggling with uh, assurance of salvation all the time. And the person said, I just wish that when you believed in Christ, that there were some sort of certificate that could come out and it's sealed and you have it there and you can turn to it. Uh, yeah, I mean, we, we all would like that. Uh, rather than walking by faith. 
mm-hmm. and, and understanding that it's not something that we can quantify and, and verify. So it's, it's almost, if you think about, um, if you think about David, what is his downfall? It's taking a census. Why is that a problem? It doesn't seem to be a problem. Well, what he's trying to do is to say, I can count the people that I have. I can count how powerful I am so I can rest in that. And God says, no, 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 no. You you don't rest in the numbers. Uh, You don't rest in the arms. You rest in me. See that with Gideon. No, I want you to have the smaller army to go in. Why? Because you could trust in me. So when God puts that number that we see in Revelation, the unique thing about that is it's not something that we can see, but something that Jesus knows. A lot of the time when we look back at sort of the heroes uh, and heroines of the faith, whether they're people sort of in church history or people in our own lives that we look back on and say, that person was really faithful and courageous and so forth. We can only see that looking backward because at the time, it doesn't look that way. At the time, nobody sees that but Jesus. Those are just the things that we can see now. There's much more of that that you don't see until the perspective of eternity. It just doesn't feel like it in the moment. In Revelation 17 and 18, Uh, We get focused on Babylon, this great city. Of course, you know, throughout the Bible, we've been tracing Mm -hmm. uh, really what is Augustine said, you know, the story of two cities. We've had the city of God and the city of man and Babylon throughout the Bible. Babylon's address must have been 666, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Babylon represents this uh, human centered power and authority and so here is a picture of, of Babylon. And in chapter 17, Babylon is presented to us as a, as a harlot mm-hmm. or prostitute. Uh, Revelation is full of contrasts, isn't it? We mm-hmm. were just talking about this contrast of being marked by the beast or marked by Christ. And here's a contrast between the holy bride that God is preparing for his son and this prostitute. Mm -hmm. And this prostitute is out to seduce, um, to destroy. When we find out where her power comes from, her power comes from the beast. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the key verses in this whole picture of Babylon comes in verse 4 of chapter 18. Here's this voice from heaven. What does the voice from heaven say? Come out of her, my people, lest you take part in her sins, lest you share in her plagues, for her sins are heaped high as heaven, and God has remembered her iniquities. So here's the call to the believers who are receiving this letter. You're living in Babylon, you're living in the world, and yet there's a sense in which we must come out of her. Mm -hmm. I I would call that the challenge of the Christian life. Yes. So talk to us a bit about Babylon and what it's going to mean for us to come out of her. Well, think about the connections between that beast language and the Babylon uh, language. Uh, Babylon, if if you look, I mean, like you said, it's, it's woven throughout the Old Testament. But look in the book of Daniel, where you have Nebuchadnezzar, who wants to deify himself, make a gold statue that people are to bow down to, and ends up like a beast in the field. He's frothing at the mouth out in, and, and eating grass as, as one of the beasts of the field. Um, so you, you have that reality showing up. God is saying what seems to be so powerful and so permanent can be brought down in an instant. And then you come to this, he's talking about Babylon, fallen is Babylon the great, and she's been brought down in a single hour. So the tendency, I think, is to look at what seems to be so permanent, and yet the Bible says is passing away. And it, it seems like it will always be there and it will always be the case. And it's, it's coming down. And so the very thing that you want to do, which is to say, I want to identify 
with this world system, with this, this structure. I want to identify with them because I want to share in their power and their renown and and all of these things. Wealth, Wealth, comfort. Yeah, comfort, all of that. The very thing that you're wanting then becomes the problem because all you can see is just this limitlessness over here. And I'm going to share in that because I'm united to it. And then what happens? You are taken down with it if you don't come out of it. So it reminds me of um, a study uh, not long ago that was talking about uh, fame and about why do you see so many famous people who just come apart, especially if they were famous as children. And what this study said is it's not so much that the fame does something to people as much as it is that people who want to be famous really want to sort of have kindness ahead of time. That uh, if I'm famous, then people know me, and that means that people like me. He says those are the least equipped people for fame because what they don't see is fame actually does the reverse. People want to take you down. They want to build you up, and then they want to take you down. And that's what's so destructive to a lot of these people is the very thing that they've spent all their their time trying to achieve is what takes you down. And that's what I think Jesus is saying uh, to these churches is if you start to value all this stuff and you want to be included in it so that you can share it, you just don't see where it's going. It's going somewhere awful. I mean, the same sort of uh, language that he's using in Revelation 12 about the devil being cast down and his wrath is all the greater because he knows his time is short. Time is short, and so he's lashing out. Babylon looks to you like it's never coming down, which is on the one hand, good news, Babylon's going to fall. You don't need to worry about it. It's, it, it can't do anything to you. But it's also bad news because if, if that's what you're anchored to, it's not standing. It's, it's coming down. Are there some things in Revelation that you can personally grab hold of that build your courage and give you hope, hope even for... This church that we look around and we see has lots of issues and problems. What gives you hope and confidence and helps you take hold of these promises that are held out to us? Well, a couple of things. I mean, one of them is if you look at, you know, we started with these letters to the churches. I mean, sometimes I think we read Revelation and any other book of the Bible chapter by chapter as though it it had been given out in installments. And so we, we see each section as being as standing on its own. I know in popular culture, if somebody is referring to the book of Revelations, that they don't really know uh, the Bible and they're just trying to uh, pretend like they do. It's not the Revelations. It's a revelation. It's an apocalypse that is coming. It's all holding together. The church is a mess in Revelation 1 through 3. He's he's speaking to churches that are in crisis, and they are the ones that he is revealing the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ. They're they're the ones who get this revelation of the bride coming down from heaven, Uh, all of these things. So I think sometimes what we want to do is when we look around at a church that is often just in disastrous situation. Sometimes I think that throws us and we start to get cynical and we say, oh, okay, well, this doesn't line up with the Bible, which must mean the Bible is false. But Jesus never gives us this idealized view of the church at all. And the Bible is completely honest about that. It doesn't do so with a sort of, oh, well, you know, that's the way it is. You know, I think we all, we both know people who will just say, you know, I'm just the kind of person who tells it like it is. And you'll say, yeah, you're mean. <laughs> you know, but like, ah, what can you do? I think sometimes you're saying, ah, you know, we're, we've always been uh, in trouble. 
No. Jesus says, repent or you'll have your lampstand removed. But then he comes in and, and speaks to them about all of these promises, and there actually is a, a, a way to turn around by the grace of God. And so I think that's really uh, important. The other thing, if you look around over the past couple of years, you've got a global pandemic, you've got almost every church, every denomination, every family just about divided and uh, friendships that had been together for 25 years are gone. You know, you, you look at that and there can be a sense of despair about it. And yet you go to Revelation 20. The, the church has spent a lot of time and energy arguing about what Revelation 20 uh, means in terms of the future. But put that aside and think about what it means for the present. When Jesus is pulling back the veil and showing you who's on the throne and the people who are on the throne are the beheaded ones. I mean, they're the ones who face the very outcome that a lot of these people, when they're losing their courage, would have feared. I don't want to become like that guy. Mm -hmm. He says, they're the ones who are reigning with Christ. I mean, that ought to give us a sense of hope when you're looking around, but also a sense of, I've got to be constantly reprioritizing what I think of as winning. Because sometimes what I think of as winning is actually what's killing me. I think that's a word of, of a warning to us all, but it's also a word of hope. Yeah. Thank you so much, Russell for talking with us. Well, thanks for having me. I'm excited about the book. I think it's going to help a lot of people. I appreciate that. This has been The Blessed Podcast, a Crossway podcast hosted by Nancy Guthrie, the author of Blessed, Experiencing the Promise of the Book of Revelation. I hope you'll join me in the next episode of The Blessed Podcast as we seek to hear and keep what is written in the Book of Revelation and thereby experience its promised blessedness. Blessedness.